Okay, uh, we are happy to, to start the second day of, of this uh, session. It's part of the, uh, the bigger, uh, bigger uh, desertification uh, conference, but we are dealing with, uh, with people, people in the past, people in the present. And uh, this session today, uh, we have uh, four uh, presentations. Uh, three is about, uh, are about archaeology, uh, pastoralists in the past, their resilience, their uh, maybe uh, collapse. Uh, this is part of the discussion, how resilient they are, how uh, prone they are to collapse. And we have one paper that is uh, an anthropological observation of current day societies in the in the si in Sinai. So it will be a nice uh, comparison, different uh, places in the world and a uh, different uh, time periods and different uh, conditions. I remind all of you that uh, all the full uh, papers or presentation are, are on the website of the conference. Uh, so you can see them, you were supposed to see them beforehand, but if you didn't, you can see them afterward. Uh, in this session, each of the presenters will talk for five to seven minutes. We'll have a very short summary of the papers. Then we have two discussants. I will ask them also to limit themselves to maybe seven minutes or less. And then we'll open the floor for, for questions. So we hope that there will be, uh, will be questions, comments, discussion. This is a part of the, um, of the uh, framework or our wishes for this, uh, this session, this, this uh, conference. So without uh, more information, uh, we'll start uh, with our spec uh, first speaker is Professor Steve Rosen from Ben Gurion University. Probably all of you know him. He's, uh, uh, have many years of, of uh, archaeological work in the Negev from the, the Paleolithic, or not maybe not Paleolithic, or Stone Age, uh, yeah, Paleolithic as well, to current day Bedouin, so very, very wide, and one of the maybe world, worldwide experts on, on desert archaeology. So, so Steve, please, please start. Thank you, Gidi. And now, yeah. Okay, hold on. I just need to arrange my screen so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, and for some reason, that's more difficult. Okay, so I want to, again, we have seven minutes, so this is very brief and um, not detailed, the full paper is already um, online. The full paper with this, with this PowerPoint presentation. My point here is that collapse as we uh, see it archeologically and as we see it anthropology, anthropologically is almost always seen from the perspective of the settled zone of sedentary societies of civilizations. And collapse when it's applied, when the idea is applied to desert, desert societies uh, requires a different set of perspectives. It requires a different set of definitions. Those that we apply to the settled zone are not applicable. Uh, they're not applicable for a number of reasons. Um, among other things, pastoral and mobile societies shift territories. This is to orient you as to where we're working. I am here. I've been working in this area for the last 40 years. And this is very much a mosaic desert. So we have very varied environments. Um, and I've been working especially out here in this area. One classic case of these shifting um, territories is that of the Ayada uh, tribe from North Arabia, which over the last 200 years has shifted from North Arabia through Jordan through the Negev into Sinai, and now is located in the Eastern Delta of Egypt, leaving bits and pieces behind all the time, but with, in some senses, very, only very tenuous relations between the bits that were left behind in Arabia and the main parts of the tribe that are in the Eastern Delta now. If we were to look at this archeologically, what we would see is, an abandonment in Arabia or an abandonment in the Negev 
or an abandonment in Sinai. And if we didn't have the ability to connect up these chronological phases, we would see a series of abandonments or collapses. And of course it's not, we have a continuity if we can tie the geography together, but in terms of archeology, span it's very difficult to tie the geographies together because we work in limited areas. This is a, a, a um, summary of how we see collapses in the settled zone, in the Negev, and um, in different parts of the Negev. The red lines indicate presumed collapses, and the uh, and then there are blanks as well. So we actually have area periods where we have very little. I want to point out what I've done in the paper is divided the desert societies into two groups. Those groups which penetrate the Negev in an episode and then contract or withdraw from the Negev and those societies which are indigenous to the Negev. And we, we should define collapse differently if we should even be defining collapse in these situations for these two different kinds of desert adaptations. Because one kind of collapse, or sorry, one kind of adaptation is an extension of the settled zone societies into the desert. And when those societies withdraw back into the settled zone, it's not really a collapse, it's a contraction, but it's transformation more than a collapse. Among the indigenous societies, we have different things that happen. We have shifting of boundaries, which sometimes causes us not to see things. And what we see in this graph are two sets of shifting boundaries. I'm looking here at long, uh, long-term subsistence systems and north-south boundaries in the desert. And what you can see, for example, here is that over the course of literally millennia, the edge of agriculture fluctuates north-south depending on technology, climate, and economic systems. What we see, of course, here is the deepest penetration of agriculture, of agricultural systems based upon the Roman Empire and based upon the technologies of runoff irrigation. What we see, for example, here is a lesser penetration based upon Iron Age and uh, Iron Age civilization, and in fact, um, a lesser level of organization of runoff irrigation. Up here, we see fluctuating edges of agricultural system in the Northern Negev, which to a great extent are dictated by climatic fluctuations, which I'll get to later. And of course the modern period, which isn't quite accurate. Um, well, it's not accurate because I haven't brought it up to 2000 uh, CE, but in the 1940s and, and 1930s, we have agriculture in the central Negev on the part of, of, of uh, Bedouin which goes down to stable care. So this line would actually come down here. Here we have the same kind of graph, but areas of pastoral habitation in different periods. One point to be seen here is that in fact, there's not a perfect correlation between pastoral expansion and agricultural contraction and vice versa. Another point which is crucial for us to understand is that there is no direct or perfect correlation between climatic fluctuation and settlement fluctuation. I don't want to go into this minute, in detail. One minute. One minute, all right. So we see this in three graphs here, settlement in the Northern Negev, settlement in the Central Negev and climatic fluctuation. Here we see, again, the same thing summarized in text form a, uh, uh, a warning not to use the Bedouin as stereotypes. And then very quickly, pastoralists adjust. They don't collapse. What we see here are four slides, which I will go through very rapidly, showing changing patterns of seasonality. These are, this is hunter-gatherer seasonality, so let me, uh, based almost exclusively on ecology. 
what we have here is the rise of economic economic ties to the uh, to the center of the country, even greater economic um, economic ties to the center of the country, changing patterns of seasonality, and finally. Um, which period is this? The classical period where the markets play a major, major role in how seasonality of Bedouin, or this is not Bedouin, of pastoral groups in the desert. So pastoralists in the desert adjust to changes by adjusting seasonality, by adjusting territoriality, by adjusting a, a social organization, et cetera. It's not merely, a, it's never merely a chain, a, a question of abandonment or collapse. And it's always appropriate to end with Ozymandias. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I will much, stop there. That uh, was very, very nice uh, on time. Uh, can, you, can you release the screen? There you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, the second uh, speaker is uh, myself. So I will uh, share my screen with you. Is it okay? You can see it? Okay. And I, I'm uh, uh, Gidon Shelach Lavi. I'm from the Hebrew University for many years. I worked in uh, North China, but recently uh, in uh, Mongolia as well. Uh, and this is my talk is about uh, related to my, my uh, research in Mongolia. I will start the, the clock now. And just by, by saying that I'm definitely not an expert on uh, Mongolian archaeology or Mongolia lifeways. I'm just giving you some summary of what I think about the, the questions and related somehow to, to my own research. Uh, and the question of the resilience with, versus the fragility of pastoral way of life. Or in other way, what is resilient and what is what can be collapsed or what is fragile? This is what I want to ask. What can be collapsed? and what can uh, be maybe more resilient and sustained. Um, just to, to a quick note that we all know that uh, locating prehistoric and early historic pastoralists is, is a problem in the, in the field. And this is from our survey in uh, Mongolia. Um, and so a lot of time when we talk about the archeology span of those regions, uh, we talk about monuments, but monuments do not represent the daily life. And I will talk about this. What do uh, monuments represent and how they are related to a uh, collapse? Um, one aspect that Steve also mentioned and yesterday many people mentioned is uh, mobility. Mobility is a strategy of uh, adaptation, a strategy, a strategy of resilience, resilient and you can see the quote uh, below. But we have to ask how mobile those people were, how long, what, what was the, the range of, of, of movement? Laser is also talking about it in, in his uh, talk about Sinai this uh, afternoon. Um, just a very, very nice map that I found in, in one of the uh, paper, not necessarily related to that, but just a, a, a quick view on, on uh, current research in Mongolia. And I see this is a baseline for, for mobility. Mobility that exists, but not so, uh, the distances are not that huge. You can see the winter camps, the spring camps, the summer camps are quite close to each other, maximum six uh, kilometers from each other. It's true that this is in central Mongolia, in the Gobi to the south, maybe the movement is, is uh, larger uh, ranges, the animals might move to longer distances with or without the people, but still this is the basement that we can, the baseline that we can think about. This is a very stable way of life. They don't have to move very much. As I said, it's quite difficult to, to locate earlier uh, campsites of uh, pastoral societies in this environment, but this one attempt, and there are several others that use shovel test uh, techno techniques, were able to locate very, very small fragments of, of uh, that remains from human occupation. And as you can see, it's quite similar to what we see today. Uh, winter camps near the, the mountains, the mount, the pit mount, uh, summer camps near the river, movements of five kilometers, that's it. So it's still, you can see, we can say that this is a very stable, and, uh, and uh, a resilient way of life. It doesn't change through time very much, and it doesn't require long distance 
movements because of the way they utilize their resources. And this is again a quote from uh, Honeychurch, which is uh, one of the best or um, most well-known um, archaeologists of, of Mongolia and, and others uh, that said that lo this long distance movement that we associate with pastoralist society uh, a lot of time is a lot of, of time or, or mainly associated with later period and with uh, with empires, with, with states, not with a basic fundamental way of life of the pastoral uh, um, uh, community of the pastoral society. And this brings me to uh, monuments. Monuments that we see there are different types of monuments. We have here from the Bronze Age, from the historic period, period I will take an example from a big city, a city that was the, the capital of the Uyghur uh, Empire during the 8th and 9th century AD. It's a huge city which was constructed inside the, the step zone, some 25 square kilometers according to some estimates, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people living there. And this is of course a different kind of situation uh, than the, the regular uh, family base or tribe base uh, um, uh, of um, uh, society of the pastoral economy. Now this city collapses. It collapses with the empire that, that established it, the Uyghur Empire, and we don't, we shouldn't go into the detail why it was collapsed, how the empire was able to sustain this large city. I can talk about it later in the questions, but just to, to, to uh, make a note that what collapses was not the pastoral way of life. What collapses was the upper structure, the, 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 the empire. And the people who replaced them, the Kyrgyz, were also pastoral nomadic. So the, the actual way of life did not collapse. What can sometimes perhaps bring a collapse or a change or a dramatic uh, need to change or to adapt are climatic, uh, extreme climatic event. And I must say that I'm not talking about climate change, long-term climate change, I'm talking about drastic climatic uh, event. In research that I did with my colleagues, uh, Ronnie, Professor Oli Elmblum and uh, Lee Ali, uh, we identify a period of such drastic and concentrated uh, climatic event, especially cold event during the late 11th and the beginning of the 12th century AD. And this correspond to the collapse of another dynasty, the Liao dynasty and the rise of the uh, Jin dynasty. And this has to do, and I have one minute to finish it, with project that I'm currently conducting in Mongolia that looked at this long wall. It's a project that was recently funded by the ERC called the Wall Project, but we already did two years of field season. Very long walls or series of walls. One of them is this one that we started working on, which is 700 and so kilometers with a different structure, but the entire system is more than 3,000 kilometers. And it's, the question is, why would somebody construct a wall in such an environment, very far away, very, very isolated uh, location? It's not only the, the wall, but also the um, structures like this one, uh, clusters of structure, huge structures. And just to make my argument uh, uh, sh uh, short, uh, this is the whole system, the wall, the wall here and those structures that we think, according to our analysis, the team analysis, that this was not a military structure. It, does, it was not meant to stop armies. It was meant to stop people. The movement of people may be pushed by extreme climatic events into towards the south. So we have a situation that did affect the, the basic life of those people and they moved southward. And this is maybe not so different from what we see today, bring you back home to the Negev, the fence uh, near Eilat, which again was not meant to stop the Egyptian army, but to stop refugees, some of them because of climatic uh, conditions. And just have a look at this fortress on the Egyptian side and our uh, structures in Mongolia, maybe it's something that is quite uh, similar to each other and I'm over uh, the uh, time. So thank you very much. And okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, now uh, we move to our uh, third speaker, which is uh, Professor Gidon Avni. Is, can Gidon present? I don't see him. Is he here? 
You don't? How many family? No? no I can't see him. I could speak for more. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, laser is laser here. Maybe we'll we'll uh, start with laser and then move to Gidon. But I don't yeah. see laser as well. Oh, laser is here. So uh, we'll change the order, and the, the third speaker will be uh, 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 our uh, guest, Laser Bergman, who is uh, worked for many years with, with the National uh, Park Authority of Israel, but also have very long and interesting experience working in the uh, Sinai uh, desert with uh, the local Bedouin tribes. And this is uh, the document that is uh, submitted. And you should read it, very interesting, about how they cope with uh, stress. And uh, laser, please. And laser, if there is a problem with uh, sharing your screen, I can share my screen with your presentation. Uh, Noah, Noah, would you be able to share the screen of Laser, please? Yes, I can do it. Um, one screen. Uh, Gidi, do you hear me? I just asked uh, Noah, to, okay? Thank you. Uh, just a minute, I'll, I'll just have to find it. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Gidi, do you hear me? Um, just asked uh, Noah, to, okay? Thank you. Uh, just a minute, I'll, I'll just have to find it. Oh, oh, I can't find it. I can't find I can't see it. I'm sorry. I can see my screen. Mm. No. <laughs> sorry, it's, it will take me a minute. I don't know how to share from here. The you cannot no it's, it's on my my computer but in uh, somehow i can see it when i'm trying to share um i don't know why no paper no paper show windows what no oh sorry uh here it is oh okay is laser share is a screen it's okay um, we have to unmute uh, Shlomo or Laser. Sheshem, uh, you will mute. Okay. שומעים? ערב טוב, אני ארצה על נושא של אסטרטגיית קיום שבטי החיוואד בזמן הבצורות של 76 עד 80. הבצורת היא צרובה עמוק בתוך... הבצורת היא צרובה עמוק בזיכרון הכללי של הבדואים. כששואלים בזמן בצורת מישהו מה נשמע, אז הוא יגיד דוניה מאכל, הוא לא יגיד אלחמדילה כרגיל, אלא הוא יגיד דוניה מאכל שהכוונה היא העולם בצורת. אפשר גם לשמוע על בן אדם מסוים מתי הוא נולד, שנתיים לפני השיטפון הגדול. אם אנחנו מסתכלים בספר של ערף של ערף, שבטי הבדואים במחוז באר שבע, הוא מזכיר שם סינת אל ג'ילדה, שנת האור. זו השנה שבה הייתה בצורת כל כך חזקה, היה מדובר על 1863, שהבדואים אכלו פשוט את האור של הבהמות. גם אנחנו מכירים את כביש הרעב, כביש 241 בצפון הנגב, שהבריטים מסללו אותו על מנת להציל את הבדואים מהרעב שנוצר מכמה שנות בצורת. שבט החיוואט... איך אני מבין את זה? אתה יכול לפייג' דאון. לא, לגלגל את זה. ככה. שבט החיוואט הוא נמצא במרכז סיני, על שטח של כ-5,000 קילומטר מרובע. 
השבט הוא קטן יחסית, ב-1977 במפקד היו שם כמאה שמונים משפחות, שבט עני ביותר, אנחנו רואים פה אנשים שגרים, אין להם אפילו אוהל, גרים בחוץ, חיים בחוץ ונודדים מרותם לרותם למעשה. המסחר של השבט התנהל דרך קבוצה של סוחרים מלרישים, שהיו עוברים עם המשאיות פעמיים שלוש בחודש. כל משאית כזאת זאת הייתה כל בו נייד, וכמו כן הם קנו מהבדואים את העיזים שלהם, את הגדיים, ולפעמים שקי פחם. בשטח של השבט שראינו מקודם, כל השטח השבט היו חמש בארות סך הכול. בין השאר השבט קיבל סיוע בינלאומי של סדקה או של סעד, שחולק על ידי ארגונים בינלאומיים, והוא עזר להם מאוד מאוד בשנת בצורת. הצעירים באותה תקופה שאנחנו מדברים עליה, עבדו באילת חלקם. לפני כן השבט התפרנס היטב מנושא של הברחות, וכמו כן של דרבל חאג', הדרך שהלכה למכה. שהיו בה אלפי עולי רגל בשנה. ב-1975 הייתה שנה מאוד טובה. זה דרך אגב במרכז השטח של החיוואט, אזור הזמת, שאנחנו רואים שהוא יבש לגמרי פה. זה תלמידי כל הבית ספר של השבט. ב-1975, כאמור, הייתה שנה מאוד טובה, ירד הרבה מאוד גשם, היה שיטפונות רציניים מאוד בנחל אל-עריש וגם בנחל פארן, ולאחר מכן, בשנים 76 עד 80, הייתה בצורת מאוד מאוד קשה. בתחנה המטרולוגית של נחל, ירדו באותן שנים עד חמישה מילימטר בשנה, לא יותר מזה, בכל ארבעת השנים האלה. בשנים כתיקונם, הבדואים היו במרחק של מסוים מהבאר, כשהם היו מגיעים לבאר עם העדרים להשקיה. במשך הזמן, כשהבצורת התחילה להיות מעיקה יותר, מה שקרה שבמקום שהעדרים ילכו אל הבאר פנימה, מהאוהלים אל הבאר, הם הלכו מהאוהלים החוצה לחפש עוד שטחי מרעה. ומדי פעם בפעם הם היו מגיעים לבאר על מנת לשתות מים. כשהבצורת העמיקה והתחילה להיות חזקה יותר, הם נכנסו לשטחים שהיו שטחים שבעצם החזיקו אותם כשטחים שמורים, אבל הם נאלצו להשתמש בהם, ולאט לאט, ככל שהשנים עברו, הם הלכו עם האוהלים והתרחקו מהבאר. בשיא, המרחק היה במרחק של בערך 40 קילומטר מהבאר, ואז נוצר מרחק, ריחוק חברתי בין תושבי השבט השונים, כי כל אוהל פנה לאזור אחר. העבודה רבתה מאוד, המרעה היה משעות הבוקר המוקדמות עד שעות הלילה בעצם. בשלב הזה הגברים... עברו להיות uh, מביאי מים, כי לא היו רכבים בשבט, לא היו כלי רכב. ההסעה של המים הייתה על גמלים, יום אחד הלוך לבאר, יום אחד חזור, ובערך זה לקח, uh, גמרו נגלה של יומיים והתחילו נגלה חדשה. לייזר, אתה יכול רגע אחד לעצור את ההצגה ולכבות את האפליקציה, כי אנחנו שומעים אותך פעמיים וזה מאוד קשה לשמוע. פשוט תחברו את, את הבראוזר, איפה שנכנסתם. נכנסתם דרך ה, ה, הקישור, הדפדפן הזה של הכנס, תחברו בלב. אותו, תשארו רק עם הזום. מכיוון שנשארו, נותרו כמה דקות ספורות להרצאה. עדיף אולי לסיים את ההרצאה. וגם להעביר את השקופיות מדי פעם. אוקיי, בואו נמשיך. לייזר, יש לך שתי דקות, אז בואו תסכם, תגיע לסיום. 
לא כדאי, לא כדאי לעסוק בדברים טכניים בשתי דקות האלה. לזר כרגע על מיוט, צריך לפתוח את המיוט שלך. לא שומעים אותך כרגע. לייזר, אתה יכול לעשות אנמיוט? אוקיי, שומעים? כן, עכשיו אני עשיתי אנמיוט. מה שאנחנו רואים פה בתמונה זה בבצורת של השנים האחרונות, ב-2020, בפברואר השנה, בעין פורטגה. אנחנו רואים את העיזים שהם פשוט מאכילים אותם בסכין ריקים של מלט. זה האוכל שיש להם. כאן אנחנו רואים שיירה של גמלים שהגיעו עצמאית לבאר ומחכים שיגיע איזשהו בדואי וישאב עבורם את המים. אין להם שום דבר אחר. אנחנו רואים פה עדר בקצה קצה השטח, זה כבר ממש בג'בל איזמה, בשיא תקופת הבצורת. הבצורת גמרה, גרמה לתעוקה כלכלית מאוד קשה. האלרישים ניצלו את המצב שנוצר על מנת להוריד את המחירים של הגדיים. הגדיים בלאו הכי היו קטנים יותר ורזים יותר ונאלצו למכור אותם לפני הזמן, כי לא היה להם מספיק מזון. הבדואים נאלצו לקנות גם מזון לעצמם, כי לא היה להם את החלב, אז הם קנו קופסאות טונה בדרך כלל. ועל מנת לקיים את עצמם כלכלית, הם מכרו את הגדיים במחיר ממש זניח, במקום 400 שקל, 400 לירות בשיא, המחיר ירד ל-20 לירות בסוף התקופה הזו. כמו שאמרתי, הריחוק החברתי הזה גם גרם לתחייה של אירועים שבטיים כמו הזוהרה, זאת תמונה של זוהרה בשנה ברוכה. מה שהבדואים נקטו באסטרטגיה של הבצורת, קודם כל לכל משפחה היו ממגורות. בתוך הממגורות האלה היה זרעים גם לזריעה וגם לחירום, וגם היה להם קש, קצת קש לבעלי חיים שהם השתמשו בו בזמן חירום. כמו שאמרתי, היה להם שטח שמור, מעין שמורות כאלה שהם שמרו אותם על מנת לשקם את הצמחייה. בזמן בצורת נכנסו לתוך השמורות האלה. לייזר, תנסה לסיים כי הזמן עבר, אז תנסה להגיע לסיום. אוקיי, ובסופו של דבר הם נעזרו מאוד בידע של המבוגרים, של הזקנים, זקני השבט, שהם לא תמיד היו זקנים, על מנת להתנהל בתקופה הזאת. תודה רבה. תודה רבה, לייזר. רק תפסיקו, נועה, את יכולה לסגור את המצגת, לסגור את הדף, את השייר סקרין. גדעון, מה מצבך? אתה יכול... כן, אני בק. אוקיי, אז... אחרי הרבה סבבות, אז אני בק. אוקיי, אז הבא שלנו יהיה פרופ' גדעון אבני. פרופ' אבני זה... a professor at the Hebrew University, Department of Archaeology, and also the Israeli Antiquity Authorities. Um, and uh, he uh, also worked on relevant issue, the transition from the Byzantine to the Islamic period in Israel more generally, but also on pastoral archaeology of pastoralists and pastoral adaptation in uh, uh, South uh, Israel. Uh, so, uh, יש אפשרות, כן, 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 כן,
Okay, Good. so you can see the screen and hear me. Uh, so my talk uh, in many ways will be incorporating the three previous uh, uh, talks and I will try very briefly to summarize uh, or to put the finger on the point when desert society and imperial powers meet, what happens? Is it conflict? What uh, goes on with the resilience of the desert society? What kind, kind of coexist, coexistence is being developed? Uh, and my uh, case study or the point of reference uh, is back to the Negev uh, and uh, a chronological framework uh, with what we call late antiquity, more or less between the year 400 and the year uh, 1000. And uh, the Negev is particularly interesting in this period because uh, we see a point of contact between urban centers, rural hinterlands and the nomadic periphery we have a, a transition and re a re region between culture and religions, and we have many uh, influences uh, in this region. When we start from outside, inside, from the nomadic periphery, which is very visible in the archaeological record, actually we have recorded hundreds of sites from this uh, period, which showed the patterns of interaction between the pastoral nomad society and the uh, more sedentary societies further to the north, agricultural, agriculturalists and uh, town dwellers. Uh, economic situation changed. The uh, export of wine, which was the major uh, income of this region, ceased because of many reasons. It's close to the sixth century, it's a whole story, the, the, the plague and the political circumstances and so on. So there was less uh, money going into uh, the region, less motivation to stay. Now these people, uh, and this is really resilience through mobility, they, they just moved probably to Northern Sinai because you see an increase in the number of uh, pastoral nomadic sites in Northern Sinai parallel to the decrease in the, in the Negev Highlands. So if you want to speak about collapse, I think you shouldn't start with the desert society, which you should start with the big structure and then go. <laughs> Yes, I want only to add that uh, the distance between the deserts here in the, in the Negev into the Mediterranean area is very, very short. The meaning is that when you, you can see cloud, and I can see cloud from here from Itzperamon, and the rain is dropping down in Ashkelon Ashdod. I can see the cloud from here. I can know that over there, there is a rain. And if I am a Bedouin, in the time that there was no fences, no limitation of uh, <coughs> movement, I could take my herd now from Speramon in the drought because it doesn't have any, 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 any rain uh, still in this uh, particular year and move over there to the Gaza Strip or to the Ashkelon, Ashdod, the, the coastline. And in, in case that there is no uh, superpower that will uh, prevent me to move, I will go there and maybe I will stay there because going back is again facing a kind of a unknown uncertainty and the next drought that is for sure will come to the Negev Highlands. So that's another question of when the northern part is not keeping well the boundaries, if there are any boundaries between in, uh, the, the south, the desert and the Mediterranean, in the end we'll find a Bedouin sitting in the Galilee. And if you know, this is the situation today. We have villages of Bedouins living in the Galilee, not in Ashkelon and Gaza Strip. So that's the, the normal way in our region of the fringe of the Middle East area. Is there any uh, time to, to add or, or we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we okay. can... So I have um, uh, many things to add from, from Bedouin poetry and from Bedouin language and uh, other things, but I just, uh, to this, to what uh, you have said uh, now, I just want to add uh, a few uh, details. Uh, in April 1922, the uh, British mandate estimated the numbers of the Bedouins in Negev. 120,000, okay? And in December 1946, we're talking about 65,000. What is the difference? The difference is, uh, is uh, uh, only one thing, a heavy drought in the Transjordan and uh, great rains uh, uh, in, the, in this winter of 1922 in, uh, in the Negev. So we see a mass migration only for one year, for, for a few months um, of Bedouins from all over the area, and then they go back to their own, to their uh, uh, original uh, uh, territories. Um, 
So this is one thing. And another thing about what uh, Gidon uh, Avni said, uh, uh, just just to, to, to understand that maybe there is a mixture uh, in the utilization of natural resources in the Bedouin society, but there is uh, a strong and, and, and a, a clear uh, social segregation between uh, farmers and Bedouins. And uh, they, they, are not, they are not mixed uh, uh, in almost any, any case. Do, do we have yes, uh, Vinon? Yeah, Vinon. Yeah, Vinon. Uh, I would like just uh, I would just like to join uh, the comments from uh, by Gidon, by Noah, and by Arlene, uh, which uh, for me make a very good transition for tomorrow's uh, session, uh, in which uh, some different views, I hope, of uh, what resilience is uh, will be uh, presented. Okay. Okay, so maybe it's a it's a good uh, place to to end our our meeting today, and hope everyone will come tomorrow to the last session of this uh, this uh, this uh, group. Uh, so we meet today tomorrow. Sorry, at four o'clock. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>